So as Mary Bell said, I run strategy and partnerships for Bitly. What she didn't mention is that I'm a recovering music industry executive. And I started out my career on Wall Street, spent some time at AOL, MajorLeagueBaseball.com, which is like American cricket, and FIFA. <laughs> um, I know what you're thinking. This is the individual that's responsible for pretty much everything that's gone wrong since the turn of the century. I have alibis. I was off of Wall Street before derivatives became a dirty word. I joined AOL post the decision to merge with Time Warner. Um, I was at FIFA um, long before all of the executive committee scandals. And um, all right, I was at Major League Baseball during the height of doping. That's when all of the players were injecting themselves with steroids and other performance enhancing drugs is a clean way to refer to it. Um, but my biggest fear is needles, second only to public speaking. Um, so today, what I'd like to do is share with you some of my goriest biz dev war stories and how I came to see platforms as indispensable tools for business development. I'll start with some anecdotes from the music industry where an open platform distribution model is still a novelty. And I'll contrast that with what it's like at Bitly where an open platform is the norm. My hope is that at the end of this, you'll come to see platforms as powerful tools for business development and have learned some key lessons for how to get the most business leverage out of them. So I'm about to start my new job at Sony Music, and I'm going through my to-do list. One, read Don Passman's book, All You Need to Know About the Music Business. Check. Two, get fresh haircut. Check. Lay out first day outfit. Check. Check. I treat a new job like the first day of school. So my first day arrives, and they give me the keys to my new office on the 30th floor, Madison Avenue, overlooking the East River of Manhattan. And I walk up and down the halls. Excuse me one second. And I walk up and down the halls, knocking on my colleagues' doors to introduce myself. And I'm kind of surprised by how quiet it is. There's no music playing, but it's a music company. Um, and I go in and settle behind my desk, and my office is you know, pretty barren. I remember a rumor, though, that all the new Sony executives get to go shopping at the Sony Style Store on their first day and outfit their office. In walks my new boss. Good timing. He drops off a 300-page binder with an agreement in it and says, I'll leave you two to get acquainted. But what about my new speaker system? Welcome to the music industry. Did anyone mention that we're in decline? In contrast, the week before my first day at Bitly, I'm invited to the office in the weekly all-hands meeting called Cocktails and Dreams. It's where the entire staff gets together and reviews the week of activity over drinks. Well, I'm kind of getting a little uncomfortable with the situation coming from a closed office environment. I've got my privacy, can surf on the internet during the day. At Bitly, I'll be part of an open plan, which is where you're seated at a desk in the middle of a big open floor. Um, well, technically, I'll be standing because I'm getting one of those standing desks. And um, I'm you know, getting ready for my first day. And um, ahead of the start, I get an email from all of the employees at Bitly. And it's flooded with these animated GIFs. That's what these things are here. And I'm going to pepper them out, sprinkle them, pretty heavy sprinkle throughout, the agreement, throughout this presentation. So I hope you enjoy them. Some of them are a little outrageous. Feel free to gasp, laugh out loud. Um, but they're a part of the Bitly culture that I really enjoy, so I'm going to share it with you. So I'm going through my new job checklist, and I'm getting my prerequisite haircut. I'm thinking to myself, wielding a 300-page binder to do business development is a lot like trying to cut hair with hedge trimmers. Speaking of elegant tools, let's talk about APIs and how they play an instrumental role in business development. But first, we should be on the same page as to what business development is. It's not sales. Good business development requires continual balance. 
It's balancing risk minimization with opportunity maximization. If you're too focused on minimizing your risk, chances are you're missing out on opportunities. And if you're too focused on the next opportunity, chances are you're exposing yourself to risk. Who knew YouTube was the largest music streaming service on the web? We both failed to manage that risk and maximize the opportunity. Yes, it's possible to fail at both, and it's painful. There are three principles at the core of business development that help you minimize your risk and maximize your opportunity. Number one, knowledge is power. You want to be able to spot trends and get ahead of the disruption. There's a lot of that in the music industry. Number two, if your internal rate of change is less than your external rate of change, you're dying. You need to react quickly, be flexible, and always be evolving. Number three, supply demand. You want to encourage growth and you want to encourage innovation. No way, no how should you stand in the way of either. Platforms provide real-time monitoring to ensure you know what's going on with your customers and across your landscape. They encourage openness and they leverage the creativity of the developer community. Platforms do all of this at scale. They allow you to manage your assets, supply the demand, all while gaining valuable insights into what's going on with you and your customers. A robust and well-operated platform is like the WD-40 that keeps the seesaw in motion. It's no fun on the playground when you're stuck, and it's painful in business, as we saw before. So here I am on the first week of a new job, new industry, having already read everything I needed to know about the music business. And candidly, I'm still struggling with the difference between mechanicals and sync licenses. It's a pretty complex copyright system in the music industry. Well, let me tell you, Don Passman's overdue for a new edition, because that book certainly didn't cover everything I needed to know. It's 2009, and the first deal assigned to me is the Spotify license for North America. I'm pouring through the existing 300-page binder that covers parts of Europe, and I stumble upon a section referencing this thing called Lib Spotify. My lawyer advised, don't worry about it. It's just some blog for engineers. For those of you that don't know, Lib Spotify is actually Spotify's developer portal. Now, at the time, Spotify wasn't a big deal, but they're about to be. A little startup from the Netherlands wanted a license to operate in the world's biggest music market, North America. And they had a novel business model. They called it freemium. So aside from negotiating the terms of the deal, I knew I did need to do a lot of analysis to convince the head honcho to stop associating free and funnel with the other F word. It wasn't easy. There was a blog out there for a while called Notify. It cited all of Daniel Eck, the CEO's, CEO of Spotify's publicly announced US launch dates and their passing. So I'm a few years into the gig now, and Spotify is gaining traction in the US. And in the Netherlands, it's like iTunes doesn't even exist anymore. And of course, there's another 300-page red line to reckon with. But this time, that little lib Spotify reference is a full-blown section. And there's multiple mentions of APIs. Nope, Don Passman did not reference those in his book. So I'm doing my best to learn what an application programming interface is, and it's a real struggle. But by most measures, I consider myself a very fortunate, lucky person. And so as a matter of course, around this time, I'm in Dublin on an organized pub crawl. And assigned to be my drinking buddy is none other than Oren Michaels. A few Guinnesses later, I came to realize Spotify is not just like looking to renegotiate their rates for their streaming service. They could be the platform that powers music streaming across the internet. As a business development exec, I thought to myself, powering music across the internet is so much cooler than a peer-to-peer -peer streaming service that frankly looks a little too much like iTunes. Now their valuation is starting to make more sense. To understand how big of a game changer this open platform distribution thing is for the music industry, you need a brief history lesson. For the better part of last century, supplying was simple. Recorded music controlled production and manufacturing and distribution and marketing. 
We could count key business partners on the fingers of two hands. And if you wanted a deal, you needed to know someone, preferably a former music industry lawyer. And you'd better not be gun shy. Deals involved minimum revenue guarantees and hefty upfront payments. It was like you needed to be tight with the bouncer and grease his palm. In contrast, today, developers and garages are the new big box retailers, which means there's literally thousands of business partners. In digital, technically, there are no supply constraints. Well, unless you're talking net neutrality, but that's a regulatory issue in the US being spoken of at another conference. Consumers access content 24-7 across almost every device. And as such, scale is the name of the game, not margin. Those 300-page agreements took forever <coughs> to negotiate and expensive legal counsel. And music was sold and licensed for a, essentially a single use case, personal consumption of a full track. Well, ringtones did have their moment. Almost every other use, like radio and music videos, was considered promotional. There was really no rush to find solutions to the copyright complexity that plagued the, the industry. Everyone was popping bubbly and bathing in fat margins created from supply chain control of a single use case. In contrast, today, consumer switching costs are at an all-time low. People are moving from Facebook to Snapchat a billion times faster than they move from CDs to MP3s. And device proliferation is at an all-time high, and those devices are becoming smart. You have to be flexible and you have to be creative to stay in the game. Deal points like revenue guarantees and upfronts were the norm, and they were the main focus. It was at the expense of really understanding what was going on in the business and securing reporting on key business KPIs. Not to mention the reporting we did get was 45 days after the accounting period. There was nothing real time about it. We felt a comfort in those MRGs and upfronts. They felt like risk minimization and opportunity maximization, but even my own investment banking powered models couldn't forecast what the right balance should be. We just didn't have as much intelligence as the other side about what KPIs were driving the business. We were like fat cats and we were just relying on our MRGs. Distribution partners are not the customers and they have the potential to be disintermediaries. And in the digital world, knowing the consumer better than anyone else in the ecosystem is the virtual equivalent of owning the customer relationship. So here's what I learned from several years in the music business. And obviously, I know everything you need to know, so don't worry, Don, I'll help you with the next edition. When it comes to disruptive technology, music is always first to face the music. It's not easy for an industry to bear the brunt of every disruptive force in digital media, but could be made a lot less painful by embracing a more open approach. 300 page binders just don't cut it in today's world. And music itself is such an incredibly powerful asset and the industry is starting to embrace these powerful tools. I'm really excited to see the possibilities. And right now, it's my great pleasure to introduce to you Chauncey McPufferson, the puffer fish behind the Bitly operation. And I'll share what it's like to do business development wielding a truly powerful platform. So Bitly's known for our size, or more accurately, our lack. You encounter us daily across social, dark social, major publisher sites, blogs. A lot of the times you don't even realize that we're there. We embrace a freemium business model like Spotify. And that means we generate revenues. Most people don't know that. And we're made in New York City and we're used across the globe. We're making money licensing our enterprise grade SaaS product suite to leading brands like Pepsi and leading publishers like the New York Times. Our freemium funnel operates at tremendous scale. This month alone, we'll create over 600 million links that will create over 8 billion clicks. Yes, we do shrink long and cumbersome URLs and make them pretty, but those little links are incredibly powerful tools. In fact, at Bitly, we don't say that we create links that folks click on. Bitly encodes and decodes assets of all kinds, like invisible pixels and annoying GIFs. For URL assets, 15% of a tweet is valuable real estate. It's an opportunity to drive brand awareness. And the back half of the link is customizable and can serve as a call to action. Branding and communication, sorry, branding and customization yield a 4x improvement in performance. 
We provide valuable insights into every engagement. Each decode or click is a 301 redirect through Bitly servers where we're dropping a first party cookie. We provide the what, the where, the how, the when, and the who of every click. So how did Bitly become the Bitly we are today? Well, we had to grow up real fast. We were born on social, serving as Twitter's default link shortener, and suddenly, social's a thing. Our ubiquity is all thanks to our platform. We started with Twitter, and today we are integrated into thousands of technology solutions across every LumaScape. And what makes our platform so universally embraced by developers? <laughs> We've had a platform-first mentality since day one. Everything we build is exposed to the platform. Every feature, functionality offered through our own products and services is built using the same API endpoints that we expose publicly to third parties. Essentially, we're chowing down on our own dog food. I have no idea how we got the dog to do this and not just pour into the Chinese food dish. <laughs> Very well trained. The endpoints are structured to allow for maximum flexibility. They come with detailed descriptions, including example calls and outputs. It's not just a list of the functionality. And we have a good system for keeping those API docs up to date. They actually live within our code base. And our engineers are empowered to be leaders in the developer community. They contribute blog posts, they speak at conferences, and they host hackathons. The tech team is doing double duty as evangelists. Bitly's open platform requires systems that scale to meet demand. We've got monitoring and dashboards that closely track the activity of our platform. To prevent abuse and ensure uptime, we have hourly rate limits and 60-second burst limits for every endpoint. Our fancy underlying systems are protected by our platform. What good is demand if we, can, if we, don't, if we fail to meet it? In a new gig, I always fall back to my comfort zone, Excel. I was a banker. So I'm in my first one-on-one -on -one with the CEO, and I suspect he's still wondering if this corporate type can hack it in the startup world. Needless to say, I'm eager to show that I've got game. I learned that our customers predominantly use Bitly through these third parties that are integrated into our platform. So I ask for some basic platform KPIs. Which of our customers are using which third-party solutions? And our top customers, which tools do they use, and how much are they using them? You can't improve what you can't measure. Now I'm getting my BD game on. Does the sales team or the ops guy or the head of platform have these crucial business KPIs? Jennifer, you've got to get your hands dirty. That's code for learning how to use the platform monitoring tool built by the guy that built Bitly. So after explaining the insights that I'm looking for, I'm told that such business KPIs aren't easily accessible. And by not easily accessible, he means learn to code and run a long Hadoop job. That's not just getting my hands dirty. That's a big old belly flop into you know what. It turns out all those fancy dashboards are for managing our scale, not our business. And even if I belly flopped and pulled the data, it's tough to tie back to the customer. Our platform and Salesforce aren't on speaking terms. See, our customer accounts in the platform are identified by logins. And in Salesforce, the tool that our sales team uses, they're identified by actual customer names. And the two don't talk. So even if I did this beautiful swan dive into you know what, and even if our platform and Salesforce made nice, not all of the customer activity can be associated back to the third party solution, the tool that's integrated into Bitly that's driving the activity. That's when I got a lesson on authentication and authorization. It's how our customers allow third-party solutions to access their Bitly accounts. It's like when you give a new app access to your Google account. So here's the Cliff Notes version. In terms of Bitly's ability to track activity, not to mention customer ease of use and security, API keys are bad and OAuth tokens are good. And since our customers predominantly use Bitly through third parties, it could be a recipe for disintermediation. But with OAuth, it's the exact opposite. We know our customer better than anyone. We can see which solutions they're operating in. We can see which features they're using, how much they're using them, all in real time. So it's clear that Bitly needs no help supplying the demand. And we're learning that business KPIs are as important as systems KPIs. 
This means it's time to look at what's happening around us. So while the consumer world is getting more connected, the marketer's world is getting very fragmented. Gartner forecasts that CMOs will spend more on IT than CIOs in 2017. Okay, the marketing technology Lumiscape looks like a good place to focus my biz dev efforts on. And that partner world can get very disorienting these days when so many players are integrated via your APIs. So we launched the Bitly Certified Partner Program last spring. And we're certifying partners across the marketing technology Lumiscape. A requirement to be certified is to use OAuth to authenticate our shared customers. Similar certification programs are used by other leading platforms like Twitter and Facebook. You want to be able to organize your world for yourself and for your customers. The certified partners serve as beacons in the frothy waters of the MarTech Lumiscape. The program's a pretty fantastic marketing vehicle. We certify the category leaders in their verticals to highlight our flexible features and functionality. We've got partners in social publishing, in content marketing, and performance measurement. As our product evolves, we'll have new verticals, and our customers know where they can go and who they can trust to get the best of Bitly. We're discovering new use cases monitoring these KPIs. At some point, it turns out that a pattern's starting to emerge where a lot of links are being created, but each link is only getting a single click. Bitly's being used for SMS campaigns. Productizing that use case is now driving new business. And we're spotting new trends. One that's emerging is guiding the strategic vision of the company. I like to call it Bitly everything, but my marketing team hates when I use Bitly as a verb. So we're seeing that Bitly isn't just used for shortening links on social media. Our branding, tracking, audience capturing, and all of those insights are being used across owned, earned, and paid marketing initiatives. Knowledge really is power. At Bitly, you don't need to know the bouncer to start working with us. You just need a developer key. We maintain an open platform to encourage innovation. And as long as Bitly maintains our ubiquity, our internal rate of change matches the external rate of change, and we're surviving. To thrive, it's incumbent on upon us to envision the future needs of marketers, launch new product, and stay ahead of that changing Lumiscape. Fortunately, we're in a great position to spot trends leveraging our platform. And in case you were looking at all of those animated GIFs <laughs> instead of listening to me, here are the key takeaways. Platforms are powerful tools for business development. They enable you to scale to meet demand. They enable you to know your customer and your ecosystem better than anyone else. And they allow you to be nimble and monitor a changing landscape. But like all great tools, they must be used with care. Don't be a control freak. Business KPIs must be accessible to be useful. And OAuth is a great authentication tool when your customers ac access your assets and functionality through third parties. Certification programs are fantastic business initiatives to elevate yourself in a crowded marketplace. And don't forget to monitor those KPIs to stay ahead of disruption and spot opportunities. You got a question? So I'll ask you something similar to what I asked Andy earlier. Um, when you think about your business, it obviously started as a technology business, mm -hmm. right? And the concept of APIs were not necessarily an unknown concept to you at that time. Uh, from your position in business development, how have things changed from, say, the time you started Bitly to now, and how does that relate to APIs? Well, I've only been there six months, and we had new leadership start a little over a year ago. So we focused more on the business side. The platform's been around since 2008, and the focus has been about scale. I was at a partner's um, office on the West Coast right after I started Bitly, and the partner says, you know what? When our engineers come and interview for a job here, we ask them to build a link shortener. And if they ever had to build a link shortener while they were working here, they'd probably quit. And he was you know, basically saying that it's not that hard to build a link shortener. And I responded, well, try doing all of that at scale. So it's the underlying systems that are scaling, and it's the platform that is supplying all of the demand. Um, so that is great. It just needs to be maintained. Um, you know, I'm sure my engineering and tech team <laughs> would say it's a lot, you know, it's a, it's a lot more difficult. Yeah. Um, but we've, we've started focusing additionally on the 
on um, productizing certain things, some of those new use cases that I talked about, and really aligning ourselves um, on the business side with marketers. So making sure that our products meet their needs and making sure that our platform is integrated with marketing technology solutions. And instead, we were at one point, we were everything to everyone, and now we are the bestie of the marketers. So you basically got much more specific about what you're trying to do and make that much more productized and scalable for yep. yourself and your partners. Yep. Excellent. Thank you, Jennifer. Thank you.